Lauren D'Agostino, thank you so much for joining us on the Plant Trainers Podcast today. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. No problem. We want to know if you have a moment of gratitude to share with us and the listeners. Yes, absolutely. I am feeling so grateful for all the opportunity to connect. I've really been enjoying connection with new people who I wouldn't otherwise have met if we didn't all learn how to do this virtual thing, um, but also really enjoying um, deeper connection to myself since a lot of my personal busyness has kind of subsided or turned off in a way. Um, so just connection, like really going deep on connection and so grateful for that. I think we've all had a lot of time to connect over the last 10 months, 11 months, to connect with other people or ourselves. And as much as we are being forced to be distant from other people, it's bringing us closer to some things and people who have used that time and taken advantage of it and concentrated on the positive or who am I or what do I want to do in business or who do I want to surround myself with? I think those people are really pushing forward and will remember 2020 as a much more positive experience than we're maybe feeling it as right now. Yeah, 100%. That was my intention as as everything was kind of transpiring. Like, who who is it that I want to be on the other side of this? Um, how can I transform and, and how can I kind of cocoon in this in this moment and emerge as a as a light filled positivity spreading butterfly that was sort of the the seed that was planted in my um in my consciousness kind of in the beginning and yeah to your point I'm I'm so grateful kind of for that perspective it's fun for me to see how many people are saying how grateful they are for all this connection and being able to do this virtually over the last few months because of all these lockdowns and covid and all that We've been podcasting for a bunch of years now. It's it's I think it's our seventh year. We're approaching our four hundredth episode soon and we've been doing it all virtually for so many years. So to be able to watch everybody connect and for us to continue to connect and meet with people is really pretty amazing. So I do want to get into the thick of the podcast, but I want the listeners to know that I met Lauren through a networking group for women. It's all over North America. It's starting to go out into Europe right now. And I've met a lot of people. And, and, th and this was my way of connecting with new people. Um, I joined in April and I go to once a month with people in my own area. But once a week, I go with people across North America and I meet so many new people. And it, I'm able to listen to what they do in their business. I'm able to share what I do in my business, hopefully get some more plant-based people on board and listening to the podcast. And Lauren's the first person who I've been able to connect with where like with five minutes in, I didn't offer it five minutes in, but like five minutes in your energy and your knowledge and what you do. I'm like, oh my God, a podcast guest. This is, this is totally <laughs> amazing. And that's what the group is all about. It's about networking. How can you help other people? How can other people help you? And how could you move forward as a personal level, but also on a business level? So if anybody out there is a woman who is listening, who is saying, I'd like to connect with other people. I'd like to grow my business. I'd like to grow my plant-based world and find other amazing people. We're going to put a link in the show notes to Fem City, and I want you to use that link to explore Fem City. And if you use that link, you're going to get half price off or something like that or a free month. I don't know. You could figure that out or you could reach out to us at infoplantrainers.com. Totally didn't expect to go this way. But because of the connection I made with Lauren, that was so amazing. I want you guys to share in that too. So um, yeah, check that out. And All now right. let's let's move on. <laughs> move on. I'll put the link in the show notes. Let's put go. Put the link in the show notes. All right. So what we want to know, Lauren, is how did you find a plant-based lifestyle and what changed for you? Yeah, so much changed. Um, but really, I found it because my diet was heavily not plant based. I was working as a pastry chef and cake decorator and waitress at the time. So my diet consisted mostly of cake scraps, cookies, you know, triple espresso lattes and soggy french fries or like whatever leftover fried food I could get my hands on at the restaurant. So um, not only from working so much and sleeping so little, but just I was putting the wrong fuel in the machine. And I started to notice um, that there was a huge opportunity for me to, sh to shift what I was eating um, and that that would be really the best way to start to heal. Um, I had bronchitis for about five months. I just couldn't shake it. My ribs, everything. It just like, I'd have to brace myself 
just just because of the pain. Um, and so anyway, so so as I kind of started to to lift my head up from all of what I was doing, just working so hard, I noticed there were some really rad people in my awareness, um, coworkers, people at the restaurant, and they they all had this kind of common style. They had the the mala necklace, they had the chlorophyll enriched water, um, and I just got really curious. I I was asking them you know, what, what kinds of foods they were eating. I was asking them just more about their lifestyles and they all happened to be vegan, but, but kind of consciously plant, plant focused vegans, right? There's right. We know such a thing as the junk food vegan. And so I knew, I knew kind of personally, um, from being vegetarian in college for a little bit, I knew why that lifestyle and that diet would be better for me, but it was the second time around that I really, felt like it was the right thing for my body. I think from the previous time I knew intellectually that it made sense, but it lasted only a short while because I didn't actually feel kind of like that vitality, that sense of of health really th- flowing through my body. So I kind of used myself as an experiment and was really slow and graceful with the transition because I knew I wanted it to last. Um, it was It was something that was deeply important to me, both kind of to heal from um, just being sick and and feeling so thin and and kind of, you know, burnt out, worked to the bone. Um, so yeah, so that was kind of the, the path. And then I took about four months to um, really get to where I wanted to be, which was fully vegan, but focused, like I said, focused so much more on plant-based. And I was so fortunate to live in Orlando, Florida at the time as well, which has a really large, surprisingly large vegan community. So I was surrounded by, um, you know, plenty of restaurants and places to go check out as I was getting curious. I'm kind of just curious by nature. So, um, yeah, that was, that was kind of how I came to it. Um, and then, and then I've never looked back really. Um, and that was like five or six years ago, I think. So many people are starting to transition or going through that process right now. What was the most challenging part of that process for you? Yeah, probably, probably the mindset I think really is, um, and it's kind of a common thing that I see in working with people now. Um, you have to be open to exploring new things. You have to be curious. You have to be kind of willing to accept your failures um, and and just keep going, right? With with any with any change. And I think I think there's a lot of pressure that we put on ourselves, or that we feel kind of you know once you want to identify with a particular diet label or or whatever like you you feel like that's such the box that you have to be in but we we forget that it takes that it takes a little bit of work to get there um so so grace and grit kind of were the were the things that um that were helpful and also i kept the reason for wanting to transition i i kept that really close to my heart and to my belly um you know i wanted to transition for that health goal that i mentioned but also for the animals and for the environment. And and then I stayed on it so long because I fell so in love with the food that I was enjoying and the flavors I was experiencing. And, and now I feel just like this higher level of emotion, all these positive, higher vibrational kinds of things. And, and I really can kind of only attribute it to the food that, that I've been choosing. I, I think we talked about that a lot with Yogi Trathlete and the vibration of the food and, and stuff like that. And there is a yeah. difference of who's touched your food and where your food has come from and if it actually has the nutrients in it that it's supposed to because it was grown in the right way. And all of that makes a huge difference. So definitely living in a, in a warmer climate works. But, you know, we're up here in Toronto and it works for us. It, it works. It works for us, too. So there's definitely so much to say that when you get it right. And I love that you say you kind of took four months to get to where you wanted to go because a lot of people after week two, after week three, they're like, I don't know what to do. I'm reading this recipe. It makes me it, it makes me nervous or I don't know where to get these ingredients. And it's there's so many reasons to give up. So give yourself time and be kind to yourself is a really good lesson from that story. So thank you so much for sharing it. But hang on, you said when you get it right, And I don't think that there ever is a get it right because I think it's an evolution and it continues to evolve. Even for us as nutrition coaches, helping clients or talking in our personal lives, our nutrition continues to evolve 
and change. And what might be right today might change a little tomorrow to be a little bit more right for that moment. For that moment, exactly. Yeah. For that moment, for that next goal until you say, okay, well, if I've gotten here, now what can I do next? Exactly. Totally. So what can I do next? That's a really good question. What can people keep in their pantry on a regular basis so that they have access to making interesting meals, not just, you know, the same boring salad or the same, you know, because rice. all we eat is lettuce, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, right. Exactly. I don't think we've actually been off lettuce for the last little while being in winter here right now. We've been saying, okay, let's just eat warm and let's see what that does for our body this year. But um, what are some of those pantry staples that you have in your pantry and that you recommend other people have? Because not everybody is a chef like you, um, you know, we, we don't have those skills. People will call me a chef. I'm like, I'm not a chef. Have you ever seen me cut an onion? <laughs> like, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. I just know how to put it together. But what do we need in the pantry? Yeah, yeah. So for the pantry, you really can think about it in three main categories. Your flavor category, right? How are you going to make make your food exciting? And so we do that with the obvious spices, Whatever kinds of spices work for you, maybe try some new ones that you've not really cooked with before, but that maybe you notice that you appreciate the flavors of when you're out to eat or whatever recipes you're looking at that kind of look good. Um, start to bring in some new kinds of things. I've had a lot of fun with that lately. Um, and then other things for flavor too are going to be like vinegars and other kinds of condiments. So, you know, maybe you're doing tamari or if soy is no good for you, maybe it's coconut aminos or... Um, and there's so many different kinds of vinegars. You, uh, we could have a podcast on that alone um, of all the different just kinds of things that you can combine. And, and so, you know, flavor um, is, is essential. And in that also, I'll add, you know, fresh citrus, um, salt, different kinds of salts, if that's something that works for you. Um, something simple too, like fresh pepper, right? So you get the idea, right? There's all different kinds of spices. Um, I have my personal favorites, garlic, onion, um, different dried herbs, cumin, chili powder, dry mustard, um, and then some kind of sweet warming spices, cinnamon, clove, nutmeg, ginger, that sort of stuff. Do you like um, paprika? Yeah. Smoked paprika is one of my favorites. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, then considering the base, right? Plant based. Okay. So plants, nuts, seeds, legumes, that's going to be the base of what you have in your home. And that should rotate and change according to the season that you're in right so i love that you are experimenting right now with kind of staying away from lettuce right perhaps in favor of more hearty greens like kale or you know something something of that nature right so um you know choose what's seasonal choose what's local maybe some stuff that's growing in your garden um and then i always have a variety of different nuts beans canned or dry whatever works for you right there's there's no like right way to do this there's the way that works best for you and what's realistic if thinking that you need to soak your beans from dried is like the optimal way to be plant-based but you never actually do that so you don't ever actually eat beans maybe don't do that do something that works for your lifestyle that makes it easier for yourself because otherwise you'll kind of start to see the kitchen as a place that you know makes you do too much work, takes too long. Like I love the kitchen, but I don't want to be in there longer than is necessary. So I do what works for me. Um, and then, so, so we've got our flavor, we've got our, our base of plants and nuts and seeds and legumes. And then you've also got your vessels. So you can obviously put all of those things together on a plate, but you can also wrap them in a taco shell. You can pile them on a pizza crust. You can, you can put them um, on a slice of toasted bread, if that works for you, or maybe it's gluten-free bread, right? So, so mixing and matching becomes like the most fun, the most fun way to be plant-based. And then by doing that, I'm not one that really remembers like the details of why a food is healthy. Like I, I can't spit out facts like that. I just hear something's great and then boom, it's got to be in my pantry. So as I go and open the pantry, open the fridge, see what I have, I know I'm working with all the best stuff that agrees with my body. And then from there, I'm free to be however creative I want and I'm tasting as I go. And every every single time I go to eat, it's, it's a food that will serve my body. It's flavor that I'm actually craving. Um, 
but I know that it's all good stuff because I only buy good stuff. And sure, I, I waver from, you know, from the healthiest path sometimes, you know, I'm only human. Um, but I treat those moments as as really kind of special and, and sacred and they're few and far between. And, you know, otherwise it's a it's a vote for my health when I when I go to eat my meals. I think that's key. I think when you make a shopping list and you know exactly what you want to buy in the store and you can keep yourself from buying the things that you know are not serving you well, that you know are not making you feel good, then they're not in the house when you're ready to go cook. Can you go out and get them? Sure. If you're, you know, going to buy stamps at, at the far at, at the post office and there's, you know, a bag of chips in the store next door and you go buy that, okay, that's not gonna happen every day but when you only buy things and bring them into your house especially now that people aren't going out quite as much depending on where you live but not going out quite as much it we talked about this a lot during the pandemic is that you could only eat what you have i want to talk about <clears throat> sorry i want to talk about the flavoring you mentioned before with the salt or the spices and one of the things that happened to me when I transitioned to this lifestyle is I found that I was tasting food very differently than I had previously. And by removing a lot of the heavily processed foods that I used to consume, my taste buds changed over time. And I'm at the point right now where I will eat something and not add spices to it. And I will taste the food for what it's meant to be taste like. But at the same time, I know by not adding those spices, I'm losing out on some of those benefits that those specific flavors or spices have. But I just wanted to point out that it's interesting how our taste buds change over time and adjust from what they may have used to, to be. And you could still use those flavorings, but the salt might not be as important because a lot of people need salt to be able to taste their food. And then, yeah, after a while, you know, when I put salt in a dish, I go ch -ch -ch, like once or twice with the with the salt mill where it used to be like I used to grind it for minutes and minutes and minutes. So there's a huge difference on cutting back there. And then, of course, you know, overall health and water retention and all of that. But what I really want to know is how do we make how do we take these staples and make a simple meal or how how do we make some awesome meals that don't require us being in the kitchen longer than we need to but still have a lot of comfort or have a lot of satisfaction from eating them yeah such a good question so i have two kind of two parts to this answer the first is the practice of batch cooking that was a total game changer for me i knew kind of as I was going through this transition, I wanted to become empowered in this process. I didn't want to depend on a Pinterest board of recipes. I didn't want to have to search for instructions for how to put a meal together every time I had to go eat, right? That felt just like exhausting and kind of the wrong approach for me. Meal planning, like any any of that stuff, I'm, I don't practice personally. But what I was practicing was batch cooking. And by that, I mean basically taking home your groceries and as you're putting them away and as you're unpacking the produce, you're kind of breaking them down. That's that's kind of what you do in a restaurant, right? You would be prepared for dinner service. So because I came from this food service background and, and had this experience, I thought, oh gosh, there's a hack here that I can apply at home that I can have all these ingredients that are ready to go for me so that when I'm hungry, I mix and match I heat it up this way or that way, eat it cold, whip up a quick sauce, and then I have my meal in 10 minutes or less. So batch cooking was huge. So some different things um, you know, that are included in that is like pre-roasting a bunch of sweet potatoes to have on hand for either a power bowl or um, breakfast. Sometimes I have sweet potatoes for breakfast or dessert. Um, shredding all of your head of kale, it keeps for a surprisingly long amount of time if you keep just like a linen towel or a paper towel in the bag or the container with it. Um, and a lot of this I do through the food processor. So it takes hardly any time at all. And the appliances are doing the work for me. It's phenomenal. Um, shredding cabbage, shredding carrots, um, slicing different, you know, different veggies, pre-chopping some onion, if you even feel like doing that. So, so doing that was hugely helpful. Um, and then the second piece to that, because I had the right things on hand, I'd be able to combine them in different ways. And so I'll give you some examples. If you had 
which this is a pretty common thing in a plant-based home, even just a plant heavy home, right? You'll have greens, whatever greens you happened to purchase doesn't matter. Then you might have other veggies. They're seasonal. They're that that's where really you're getting your color. Okay. So think like at least three colors, different colors on your veggies and white does count as a color. We often think that white foods are not good and that's true. White processed foods are not good. Um, which I don't even like associating that term of like, not good. They're not a, they're not the best choice. Um, but white plant foods are fantastic. Um, so are, just are to- you talking about like cauliflower and yeah. is onion? Like what else would be a white vegetable? Kohlrabi yeah. or turnip. Okay. Yeah. Potatoes even too. I mean, we, we think that white potatoes are horrible. Um, white French fried potatoes perhaps could be kind of in that category, but, but the potato itself is, um, is a powerhouse. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so we've got our greens, we've got our other veggies and then, and then from there you are free to use different things. Like maybe you had a nice plant-based pasta on hand, right? And, and that would be something that's, um, got the pea protein or chickpea based or, something that's more wholesome, right? I live by gluten-free personally because that works best for me. Um, So those are some of the things that I grab for. So I've got pasta, then I've got maybe some fresh lemon. I've got some spices and different things I combine and it all goes into a pot and that's a one pot pasta dish just from having those greens and veggies, right? I could take those same greens and veggies and instead of the pasta, I could use taco shells or a pizza crust. I could have a different kind of sauce and it all gets combined up in that different way. And I've got an entirely different meal, different spices, different flavorings, right? I could take those same greens and veggies and I could use instead um, a grain or if grains don't work for you, riced cauliflower. You could add beans or legumes to that and then a different sauce still. So, I mean, it's seriously like it's it's almost like having the best basics in your wardrobe and being able to mix and match right they show like here's 10 pieces of clothing we made 475 outfits like what you can do the same thing with your food um so i yeah i hope that answered the questions that was just kind of like yeah you're basically saying let's use the same ingredients but let's change up the seasoning so we can go the italian route we can go the asian flair we could do the tex-mex you can you can make it work for whatever kind of meal you want and you're not going to get super super tired of those same ingredients because it's not the same flavor and sometimes it's the flavor over and over again that makes us kind of that's kind of what we did in our easy recipes cookbook right yeah Yeah. for sure so as we are heading towards valentine's day how do we make a dish that's a little bit more special than what we're making on a continual basis but maybe romanticize it or maybe up level it add something special to it so that you feel like you're indulging a little bit more or you feel as if it's just more of a celebration. Yeah. So for that, it really kind of comes down to not only the food that you're eating, but it's all about the experience. It's all about just providing like a little bit more, right? So I used to do this as a kid um, with my babysitter and we'd have like the cleaning lady or like whomever would be here. I'm like, can I make you lunch? Like, can you sit around the table and have lunch with us? And it would be something simple, you know, at the time, probably it was macaroni and cheese, but I would put it in a fancier plate. I'd use linen napkins. I'd have nicer glasses out and I'd, and I'd put a garnish on it or I'd like just kind of like up level it a little bit. And so whatever food you're eating, you can do that. And sometimes I do that. Sometimes my food is not as photogenic and that's okay. Um, but to make it a bit more appealing on the plate, you can think about kind of, as I already mentioned, like, like, do I have enough color on here? Is this visually exciting to look at? So that's one easy way. Another thing I love to do too is, you know, when you're dressing something or putting a sauce on it, sometimes I'll put it into a piping bag or even just a plastic bag and just cut the corner tip off and I'll do a nicer looking drizzle instead of like something that just kind of looks haphazard and um, and sort of sloppy. Um, and, then, and then again, just like that additional garnish, right? Like, do you have microgreens or sprouts or like, something else kind of nice that you can put on top of it so that whatever you're doing, I mean, even if it's just something simple, like a power bowl might be what you're having. Like, can you just take note of those details to make it feel really super special? Can you also be really present with the people that you're having the meal with no cell phones, no TV, some nice dinner music, 
you know, maybe you get out the wine glasses, even if they just have water in it, they're just fun to use. Um, and like I said, use the linen napkins, set a nice tablecloth. Like it's all about the experience that you create um, and kind of the energy to it. I think that you bring to the act of eating. It's such a form of self-care, kind of the most accessible one that so many people overlook. We're like such on this fast track of, you know, where, what's the best self-care? It's like, well, you have the opportunity nearly three times a day, sometimes more than that for self-care. Are you taking advantage of that? Are you showing your body love, the most love, you know, that you can to, to make that decision for yourself in that moment? But that's, that's kind of what it all comes back to for me is, is to the intention. Um, cause here's another kind of a, just a practical example. Also, I served a, uh, grilled cheese and tomato soup for a dinner party. And it's part of a Valentine's day menu that I'm doing. So instead of just like a boring tomato soup, right, it comes with a nice swirled, like a basil cashew cream swirled on the top and made all pretty. And instead of just like a plain grilled cheese, maybe it's grilled cheese croutons or they're cut in diagonals and just, so it's just those little attention to details and like how, how can we just raise this up just a smidge? And when us non-chef people make these fancied up kind of drizzles and meals and they don't come out as well as we hope they do, that's okay because it's all about the effort that we're putting into it, the energy that we're putting into it, the intention and the love, right? The, the love. So the secret ingredient. Our kids learned very early that the secret ingredient to every meal is love. Yeah. Well, I love that. I love that. And I love what you said too, Adam, about... Um, you know, just whatever your meal comes out as, it's perfectly beautiful the way that it is. I think we have a habit of comparing or thinking that our food in our home has to look as good as like a three Michelin star chef. But we forget that that's culinary arts related to food and food is the artistic medium. And then there's food that we eat to thrive and do our thing on planet Earth. They're, they're two separate things. But I think often we just sort of get confused that our daily our daily meals need to be like the best looking thing ever. And Instagram didn't really help people with that, right? <laughs> yeah. Because it looks like some people are eating the most amazing meals in everything. And and people have said to us, why aren't you doing, you know, higher quality pictures or staging your pictures more? We're like, because we're a busy family and this is what we're eating. It's just the angle of the phone that we concentrate on. The food is 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 the food. And we're concentrating on the food for living reasons and nutrient reasons. So I'm kind of thinking, as you were talking about cutting the grilled cheese, I'm like, you can use a heart cookie cutter and you could cut out the the middle of the grilled cheese and just like make it kind of sit on top or put rice into that cookie cutter. And, you know, you don't have to eat different food, just make it look a little bit different. So I like that idea. And grilled cheese and tomato soup to me is the best meal anyway so right. maybe we should do that for valentine's day well, the kids like that the kids not like the that. soup so much but the grilled cheese they're all over that right yeah what other recommendations do you have for people doing their valentine's covid dinners at home yeah um let's see I am offering a fun virtual class, kind of a cook-along class on Valentine's Day. I'm happy to share that with you um, if you think your listeners might like to know about that. But um, yeah, I think I think I've really kind of shared a, a good amount of my suggestions. I think the other the other thing too is is like treat this like a like a date night at home. Like maybe get get a little more dressed up than you might otherwise. Um, you know, what, what brush about, your hair. Yeah, like <laughs> yeah. people tend to think like, oh, Valentine's Day, chocolate, sweets, stuff like that. Is there some kind of dessert kind of recipe-ish dish or something that you would make specifically for this time for Valentine's Day? Yeah, sure. Um, there's there's a really easy way to enjoy, I think, the simplicity and sweetness of dates. I love medjool dates. Um, and so you can stuff them with either nut butter or any kind of nut. I love to use walnuts. And then if you have a good quality chocolate that you love to use, you can melt the chocolate and dip those into it and kind of make a little, kind of tastes like a Snickers bar a little bit. Oh, yeah. um, so those are fun and really easy. Um, and then for, for this Valentine's menu, I've done um, chocolate cake, like little chocolate cupcakes. So again, like you can find whatever chocolate cake recipe works for you. Um, this one happens to be vegan and gluten-free because that's what I 
practice and live personally, right? Um, and so I hollowed out the middle with an apple core, put in some, I made a chocolate ganache with coconut cream and vegan chocolate chips. And so that's in the center. And then you just warm that up for 11 or 15 seconds in the microwave. And it's you've got this like amazing chocolate lava cake kind of experience. And it feels really indulgent, but it's only got you know, for sweetener, maybe maple syrup or coconut sugar or applesauce. Um, and it, it feels and it looks like such a indulgent thing, but it all was created with more wholesome ingredients. So I guess that's kind of the, the takeaway from here, right? It's like, what is your best, most indulgent kind of guilty pleasure treat? And then how can you think about changing the ingredients so that it's a meal that serves you. Like not only does it taste incredible, but it's actually things that will boost your vitality. Yeah. And on Valentine's day night, you don't want to feel all disgusting and gross from all of the fried foods that you've eaten too. And at the same time, I know we're talking about some foods that have sugar in it. And we have listeners that don't use sugar, processed sugar. And that's not something that we do all of the time. It's our most of the time that really matters the most. So once in a while to indulge for a reason like this, it's it's not such a big deal. So don't feel bad about it or feel guilty or think that you're cheating your system or doing something horribly wrong. Yeah, totally. So what other, what, what, what message do you have? What other tips do you have? What do you really want people to know right now? Yeah, I think, um, I think a couple of things. So first, um, when you think about plant-based, think about it as a journey, think about it as a transition, think about it as something that will change your life, right? Because we know that it does. And so with anything that's going to be that impactful, at least for, for myself and for a lot of the people that I work with, you've got to kind of like really settle into that. Like that's a big thing. You've got to celebrate that because it, it deserves to be celebrated and and recognized that you're, that you're simply even exploring or that you're, you know, here listening to, to this podcast, right. That you, that you want to know all of this stuff. And then, um, you know, how can you, and I, I see this a lot and hear this a lot, people that say, you know, oh, but I'm not a cook or, but I'm not a chef or, but I, I, you know, I don't know so much about what I'm doing. Like, that's okay. But how can you start to say that in a different way? I'm learning how to cook. I'm learning how to feed myself in a more delicious way. I'm learning to be more compassionate in my kitchen and in my world, in my life. I'm learning to appreciate my food. I'm learning to slow down and enjoy my food. I'm learning to make better choices. Um, I think, I think by having that shift in perspective, um, it it just allows everything else to kind of flow a lot more easily. Um, and then really the, the part that's the most fun for me is kind of being in the kitchen with those people and cheering them on, um, and just celebrating every little progress that's made because, that's what boosts their confidence. That's what helps them to keep going. Even when it feels like, you know, the lower hanging fruit is something that's actually not fruit, maybe is something that's like bad, you know, or a choice that they don't want to be making. Um, so that's, that's kind of more on the, the food philosophy side, I guess. And then, um, you know, then how can you start to just swap some things that are in your pantry? How can you add in more veggies to your plate, to your life, so that other stuff that you don't want to be choosing can start to just fall off naturally? So sometimes, you know, I'll if I'm craving chips or something that, that I know I might not really want to eat, um, I say, okay, I can have those, but I have to have this huge salad or this huge bowl of veggies first. I have to have this other thing first. And then most of the time, I don't even want that other thing because I'm so full. And it's awesome. Or take that kale that you batched up earlier in the week after the food shop and make some kale chips out of that even better. Totally. Exactly. I love that advice and shift in perspective is so important. So thank you, Lauren, for sharing that. If people want to reach out and connect with you, where would be the best place for them to go? Yeah, the best place is my website, laurendagostino.com. On there, they can leave their email to get a a look at my pantry 
um, what exactly is on my list, those things that I mentioned, those different food categories. And that's a helpful starting point. Um, and then there's all sorts of other cool stuff on there. The Valentine's Day kind of event that I'm doing is, um, I call it Sweetheart Supper Club. So you can cook along with me virtually um, and other couples from across the globe for a couple of hours in the afternoon on Valentine's Day and then um, and then enjoy your meal that we've just cooked together. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and then I am on Instagram too. Chef Lauren D'Agostino is my handle. So you can follow along with, um, with what I'm up to there. I don't usually share, like, I kind of liked what you were saying, Shoshana, about, um, you know, all those like fancy food photos. Like it's expensive to have all the, all the extra little things in the shot. Um, so I, I share what the real food kind of looks like and it does look, um, you know, maybe a smidge more fancy, but honestly, I always kind of laugh at this, like what I'm doing is so simple and so accessible to everyone. And that's really what, um, what I'm excited about. I just recently released also, this is kind of the last maybe piece that I'll leave you with, um, just released a virtual cooking course, helping people learn how to do what it is I described, you know, with what, what can you do in the day to day of plant-based with those ingredients that are on that pantry list? How can you, enjoy a meal in 10 minutes or less. How can you boost your confidence? All of that stuff is taught um, in my Teachable school. And you can find that from my website or cheflauren.teachable.com. Amazing. Thank you so much, Lauren, for joining us on the Plant Trainers podcast today. We are going to share all of those links in our show notes at planttrainers.com. And we really look forward to what you do next. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Take care. Lauren.